tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It's unfortunate because it seems hypocritical. Why the BC government won't make it easier for people to buy booze. Also, bike lane tragedy. A driver is charged in the death of a cyclist in North Van. And we know there's nets out there, but we don't know where they are. Ghost nets, how lost and abandoned fishing gear is destroying marine wildlife. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. A North Vancouver man has been charged in connection with the death of a cyclist. The driver allegedly opened his car door into a bike lane that cycling advocates say is poorly designed. As Rafferty Baker reports, they don't believe the man's charge and fine address the true problem. It was disappointment. It, it wasn't a huge surprise. We know this is one of the more dangerous stretches. When news of a tragic accident involving a cyclist on Esplanade came this past January, unfortunately for people who know the area, it wasn't a shock. 55-year-old Mike McIntosh was killed while riding down this bike path. Now, the driver who allegedly caused the crash by opening his car door has been charged under the Motor Vehicle Act. Police confirmed today they aren't pursuing criminal charges. The accident was a stark reminder of what cyclists can sometimes face on the roads. With municipalities moving forward with bicycle infrastructure, more and more people are turning to bikes to get around. But often, a bit of paint on the street has to pass for a bike path. And cyclists who frequent Esplanade Avenue in North Vancouver know that's not exactly enough. The only issue that I have is people that are parked along the side on the other side of the bike lanes, they tend to pull out without really looking out for the bicycles. Maybe just up a couple of blocks, um, closer to the overpass area. Uh, I've almost been hit by a door there, and yeah, a few, a few close calls. There's no margin for error here. You're in the door zone of all the cars. If they swing a door out in front of you, or if the truck steps over the line a little bit, or if you just wobble a little bit, there's no buffers here. There's no protection. You're just really squeezed in between in a tight spot. Hub, the group that advocates for better cycling infrastructure in the Lower Mainland, is pushing for a better bike route that crosses the North Shore, including separated space for cyclists of all ages and abilities. We need better infrastructure. It's got to have some buffers or some protection so that this sort of thing just doesn't happen again. There's also education, and that's got to apply to both cyclists, pedestrians, as well as the drivers. PRC also says the Motor Vehicle Act needs a rewrite to be modernized and perhaps crafted as a road safety act for all road users. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, North Vancouver. A teen girl has life-altering injuries as a result of a crash in Surrey early this morning. It happened shortly after 1 o'clock on 128th Street near 63rd Avenue. An SUV went off the road and crashed into a utility pole causing a power outage. Police want to speak with anyone who witnessed the crash or who has dash cam video of the incident. Well, if you were hoping it may get easier to buy booze in the near future, think again. The province is giving a hard no to expanding the sale of alcohol. And as Mickey Cowan reports, it's not going down well with the industry. To have this happen today is just rather disappointing. The province not allowing beer to be sold in grocery stores. It seems hypocritical to allow international uh, wine as well as BC uh, wine, but not beer? Like, what sense does that make? Brewmaster Michael Nazarek sells his beer at the brewery and liquor stores. He sees being left out of BC's major grocery stores as another government mistake around liquor policy. It'd be better to have a, a case like Quebec, where the local corner store can carry the local brewery's beer. What's wrong with that? I don't see anything wrong with that. But BC's attorney general does. If we increase the availability of alcohol in the province, we increase hospitalizations, we increase the public costs of alcohol, problematic alcohol use. It's a one-to-one -one ratio that public health officials have looked at for a long time. Although some experts say beer is not the problem, especially when grocery stores can already sell wine. The discussion in uh, the, the research community is more making hard liquor um, less available and restrict that more. Krauss says the government should focus more on changing the culture around drinking in BC, comparing it with Europe where alcohol is more readily available and binge drinking is less of an issue. You need to 
really think about other measures like really good prevention programs in school, which we don't have. As for consumers, it's a debate as well. I think it's it's good to make it more of an occasional thing and, and to make people take the extra step to get it. It's a, it's a positive thing for a lot of people. It would be nice to have it all in one stop, you know, get your dinner, get your beer all in one place. Sounds pretty good to me. A reality many would like to see, but one that isn't coming anytime soon. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Vancouver. Vancouver police are still trying to track down a group of men involved in a violent home invasion last year. They released this photo today of one of the five suspects. Police say on November 30th of last year, the group put on masks and hoods and broke into a home near Ontario and West 49th Avenue. It's believed two of them were armed. The homeowners, a 56-year-old man and his 35-year-old wife, were restrained and assaulted while their toddler slept upstairs. The husband was treated at hospital for what we're calling serious injuries, while his wife's physical injuries were minor. The toddler wasn't hurt in the incident. Anybody with information about the attack or about the man in this picture is asked to call Vancouver Police or Crime Stoppers if they want to remain anonymous. Well, it's one of the biggest threats to marine wildlife in B.C., but most of it is hiding beneath the surface of the water. Experts say lost and abandoned fishing gear is taking a huge toll on harvestable fish stocks. The CBC's John Hernandez reports on how so-called ghost nets become an underwater death trap. Burton Scott is on a mission. The commercial diver spends many of his days looking for lost fishing nets along the BC coast, hauling them out of the sea little by little. The nets continually fish by you know, becoming baited by the animals that are caught and then new animals come in to, to eat those animals and it just becomes a kind of an ongoing sort of death trap. Lost fishing nets like this can sit underwater for decades, maybe even centuries, catching fish and destroying wildlife. It's called ghost fishing. They can cover the seabed and just completely choke out a reef or cover an area so that nothing can live there. An estimated 800,000 tons of fishing gear worldwide gets lost to the ocean through incidents like storms and snags each year. The issue has caught the attention of Scott and his close friend Gideon Jones. The pair have launched a nonprofit to clean up old fishing nets in BC, some the size of football fields. And if you just think of a net like about 5,000 of those like six-pack rings that choke out marine wildlife, you get a sense of the impact one net can have. It's unclear just how much old fishing gear is floating in BC's coastal waters. Earlier this year, DFO crews recovered hundreds of abandoned and unmarked crab traps. Last fall, this old net swept through the Fraser River, killing several seals. Thousands of nets have also been removed off the coast of Washington state. Gear that gets lost tends to sna or snag or get tangled with deployed gear, which causes more gear loss. Experts like Joel Baziuk say ghost gear could be destroying up to 30% of harvestable fish stocks. It's a loss to, like I said, fishers themselves, but also coastal communities who depend on fishing, uh, the fishing industry. Right now, much of the recovery work is being done by volunteers and nonprofits on tight budgets, but some are hopeful the tide is turning. The DFO is partnering with the Global Ghost Gear Initiative to promote clean waterways. That could mean more funding for people on the front lines. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Ghost Nets, a new CBC documentary, is available online. You can go to our streaming platform, GEM, and search for the title of the film, Ghost Nets. You can also watch it this Saturday, that's tomorrow, on CBC TV at 9 p.m. local time. A controversial Chinese government reception in Vancouver is going ahead. The Union of BC Municipalities making the decision despite ongoing criticism from many elected officials across the province. Justin McElroy joins us now. Justin, so much backlash here, so why the approval? Uh, it was one month ago that the Union of BC Municipalities said that the Chinese consulate for Vancouver would be having their reception again this year, as they have for the last six years. Of course, this year, with two Canadians being detained by the Chinese government, uh, there's more tensions there. There's been a lot of people that said they won't go to the reception, including Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart. But today, the UBCM executive met, 
They talked it over and they said that at this point it's simply too close to the actual reception in September to back off. Here is UBCM President Arjun Singh. So what we wanted to do was to really look at this from the perspective of talking to the entire membership, uh, getting everybody in local government who wants to be engaged. Uh, there's parts of the province where this isn't an issue at all. Uh, there's parts where it is an issue. There's some folks who believe it shouldn't happen, some folks who believe it should happen. So given the fact that we've already decided to do it, we would say it would stay with that for this year. Okay, Justin, so has the UBCM responded to any of the recent criticism to this reception? Well, a little bit. Part of the criticism has been on the fact that, that the consulate pays $6,000 to sponsor the reception and get their name in the program. There's a lot of other receptions that happen outside the official reception. So what they say they're going to do is they've convened a panel. They're going to talk about how in the future the UBCM conference can be funded possibly without any sponsorships, thereby avoiding this. But that's not going to placate people who didn't want the conference to go forward this year. Uh, the biggest critic has been Port Coquitlam Mayor Brad West. It shouldn't take a panel of a bunch of politicians and ex-politicians to advise some other politicians that taking money from a hostile foreign government is wrong. That, sh that, shouldn't, that is obvious, I think, to almost everyone. But apparently they need a panel to let them, <laughs> let them know that. I mean, it's just, I think, is a complete embarrassment and a cop-out, and it shows a real lack of leadership. So there you go. Whether more people agree with West or not, we'll have to see when the reception happens sometime in late September. It'll be interesting. Most of the time, it's a fairly boring affair. This year might be a little bit more action. Just might be. Thanks, Justin. Justin McElroy reporting tonight. Fisheries and Oceans Canada is putting a limit on the size of Chinook salmon allowed to be caught. It's to help spawning Chinook that are struggling to get through a blockage in the Fraser River west of Clinton. The DFO has set a maximum size limit of 80 centimeters for Chinook salmon caught at recreational fisheries. The limit is in place until the end of the month when it will be reassessed. Ottawa estimates around 2,000 fish are getting to the barrier every day, and that number is expected to increase. The goal is to leave as many larger at-risk Chinook salmon in the river to improve their chances of getting upstream. A minor earthquake that rocked Seattle in the middle of the night was reportedly felt as far north as the Vancouver area. <laughs> The U.S. Geological Survey said the 4.6 magnitude quake struck just before 3 a.m. Pacific time, about 40 kilometers northeast of Seattle. An interactive map on the USGS website shows several dozen people in the Vancouver area reported feeling the shaking too. No reports of injuries and there was no tsunami. I thought it was going to be a lot chillier than it was today. Brought in nice. my trench coat. Yes, we saw that. <laughs> uh, Brett Soderholm is here now with a look at the weather, which turned out to be a beautiful day. It really did. I mean, I actually had to do a double take. I'm standing outside on our balcony right now, and there's actually blue sky around. I feel like I haven't seen blue sky in quite some time. Um, and yes, Anita, I do actually like it when it's blue sky in addition to rain. I like all weather. That's the best part of this job. But I did want to let you know, yes, temperatures right now are definitely on the warmer side. Wanting to show you a quick look at where we're at right now across the region. You can see that in Vancouver proper, downtown at the airport rather. 22 degrees and very similar as we get into West Van. But as you head farther east into the valley, temperatures are very comfortable into the mid 20s. Now, I know the weekend is here. You might have some plans you might be wondering hey what can i expect as the weekend goes on so i wanted to prep you for that by showing you this weekend planner so if you've got any plans this night friday night that is expect low temperatures to only go down to 15 degrees few clouds are in the forecast but for both saturday and sunday i mean there's not much to complain about here we're going to be getting a mixture of sun and cloud both days daytime highs on saturday and sunday are both going to be right around that 22 degree mark downtown and again a little bit warmer if you're going into the valley but i did want to mention sunday morning that's about the only time we want to be looking to see if we might be getting a brief little shower so if you do wake up sunday morning and you see that happening don't worry the day is not a write-off it's going to be a good one so there you have it hopefully you're going to have some fun this weekend we all hope so thanks very much brett you're welcome with all the planning and preparation that's gone into the granville island public market its long-term success will likely rest with the people who sell their products here as long as they can keep the prices down and the produce fresh, it will go. Bill Dobson, CBC News on Granville Island.
And that was a CBC News report from 40 years ago today, marking the opening of the Granville Island Public Market. At the time, it was hard to imagine that a bunch of old factories would become such an iconic part of Vancouver's identity. But today, the market is a cornerstone of the city's food scene and a popular destination for locals and tourists alike. Our Tina Lovegreen joins us now live from Granville Island Public Market. And Tina, how has the market changed over all these years? Well, Mike, it has gone a lot busier. Over a million people visit the market every year. And even right now, it is 45 minutes till closing, and it's still buzzing. If you come here on a sunny day, a little earlier in the day, you can hardly make it through these aisles as people come to try some fresh produce, try some local cheeses, and sample some deli meat. This place is really kind of a getaway from the city, at least that's what it means to me and for a lot of people that frequent here. And a lot of tourists actually come here as well. It is a place to be uh, to see when you're visiting Vancouver. And a lot of the merchants have really worked hard to make it work here. One of them is Armando's Quality Meats, and we have the owner here, Armando Bacani. You've been here for 33 years. Really? <laughs> yes, that's what you told me anyway. So you've been here for yes, 33 years. Yes, and it looks like, and I asked myself, geez, where did all those years go? Because, you know, 33 years is a long, it's a, it's a lifetime already. It is a long time. And yeah. so tell me, what has the past three decades been like for you? What has been your favorite part about working here? I, you know, uh, the truth is because it's a people's place. And I guess you might say I'm a people's person. So I love this place to death, really. I, I just get my energy from people. So it makes my job a lot easier when you enjoy what you're doing. And but I guess it must be challenging as well to make it through it year after well, year. Challenging actually, again, is an understatement because when you run your own business, it demands a lot of you really your time your dedication everything pretty much because it becomes uh, you know like more than half of your life you'll spend it here so really that endurance and dedication is is really paramount to what you're doing here and so i have to ask you what do you think the next 40 years will be like for granville island what's in store well hopefully and this is just my hope again is that as far as managing this place is that it remains to be a people's place. Because you see, if you look around you, they have millions, thousands of people, not millions lately, but thousands come in here from all different diverse cultures and everybody, and they enjoy this market so much. So I'm hoping that whatever they're gonna do is that it will not only enhance, but make this place a lot more interesting, really. Because if we, as long as they don't decide that this is a public, um, uh, it's a public, a public market, place, yeah. it's a public market. So naturally, you know, in, it invites a lot of people and hopefully it will continue to be one. You know. Well, I hope so for you as well. I hope many more fruitful well, years yeah, for you here. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, it's Armando Bacani, the owner of Armando Quality Meats, one of the 70 merchants here at Granville Island Market, which the market is celebrating 40 years today. Anita, Mike? Tina Lovegreen live at Granville Island for us tonight. Thank you, Tina. Love the market. Not just the market, you got the theater, you got There's the so restaurants. There's so much there to do. Yeah. The parking challenges, but that's all part of the... But the food for me is the best part. Yeah, it's absolutely. Okay, just a reminder, you can also watch CBC Vancouver News at 6 on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And if you are watching us right now on Facebook or YouTube, we are also live during the commercial break. Well, the PM was talking pipeline expansion in Edmonton today. What he told workers there to expect, coming up. For the first time ever, Sotheby's is auctioning off rare and pricey running shoes and sneakers. Yeah, among them, Nike's original waffle shoes. Remember those? Mm -hmm. And the self-lacing sneakers from the cult classic Back to the Future. Yeah. Here's a look at what's available. This is one of the Nike mags. Uh, a lot of people probably recognize this sneaker from Back to the Future. Uh, so Nike released a very limited set of this. And this is one of the very, very limited ones because they actually self-lace. When it feels your foot in there, it automatically tightens. Um, the shoes light up, but there's also these buttons on the top. So if you do need to tighten them a bit, you can do that. So with something like the Nike Moon shoes that are probably the rarest, uh, potentially rarest sneakers 
period. Um, they have a low estimate of $110,000. These were handmade by Bill Bowerman. Um, Bill Bowerman, for those who don't know, is one of the co-founders of Nike. Um, he was the Oregon State uh, track coach, uh, and he was making these sneakers with a waffle iron, literally. Uh, the tread on the sole is from a waffle iron that he handmade. I do think there are going to be a number of female bidders in this as well, too. Uh, for collectors in the sneaker category, in some cases, it's not about wearing the shoes. Um, they view this as works of art. Um, so the fact that these are in pristine shape, and perhaps they're designed by Tinker Hatfeld, or perhaps they were owned by Karl Lagerfeld, as the NMDs that we are selling are, uh, or were, pardon me. Um, will be enough that they're going to take interest in it. So I think that though these are men's shoes, we'll see people across different demographics bidding in this sale. I think it's a really fascinating time in the world period where it's, it's not so much sneaker culture, it's just culture. Um, what we've been seeing is the evolution of culture, that it's all starting to evolve and intertwine together. We see fashion, we see art, we see luxury, all playing in the same field. You were a little shocked by that hundred thousand dollar price tag. Hundred thousand? Wow. Well, I guess so. Since so, uh, if if you're into that, some people put in a bid. Some for that people much money. collect diamonds. Some yeah. people collect shoes. Even Nike shoes. I remember the waffle ones. So I think I might add a pair of those. They were a hundred grand at the time. They were probably like twenty-five. You better fish them out of the box somewhere. <laughs> no, they're long gone. I think. Yeah. All right. We're gonna have the latest uh, headlines from across the country coming up in just a couple of seconds. Mr. Justin Trudeau got a first-hand look at the Trans Mountain Pipeline Terminal in Edmonton today. That's where Alberta oil is collected for shipment to the B.C. coast. As the CBC's Rafi Bujikanian reports, the PM told employees work on the expansion project will get underway before the end of this construction season. We need to get our resources to new markets other than the United States. Um, it's just been a real challenge to get it done. It's the kind of message you've heard from Justin Trudeau before. Today he made it right in front of Trans Mountain Pipeline workers, his two Edmonton area MPs close behind. And governments need to be responsible on the environment and responsible with Indigenous peoples and community support. But earlier this week, the Prime Minister was in much different company in Montreal, side by side with star environmentalist candidate Stephen Gilbo. Gilbo's made a career out of an anti-pipeline stance with the likes of Greenpeace. Trudeau's defending that choice. We are a government that understands that Canadians have a broad range of views on a lot of different issues. And one of the important things for us is to make sure that we are listening to the voices of Canadians, to the preoccupations of Canadians. He's also got a vocal opponent in Alberta, Premier Jason Kenney. Uh, the level of frustration uh, and alienation that exists in Alberta right now towards Ottawa and the Federation is, I believe, at its highest level, certainly in our country's modern history. This political watcher says Alberta won't exactly swing an election for the federal Liberals, but the party will still want to shore up some support. But it's a matter of trying to win a few key seats so that if you do form government, you have people in pockets, if not in cabinet, that can, can speak to that province's interests. And there may be another challenge for Trudeau before October. Six First Nations in British Columbia have already filed a lawsuit against the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. Of course, the pre-election jousting for the position is in the hearts and minds of voters, and it's well underway. The PM's appearance in Edmonton was labeled by Conservative leader Andrew Scheer a phony photo op. And while Trudeau didn't explicitly mention Scheer, he did take a shot at other Conservatives, singling out the Ontario Conservative Premier in particular. You know, Doug Ford and others have been dragging their feet on 
uh, working with the federal government that has put forward significant amounts of money for infrastructure projects, and they would rather have their citizens suffer by not taking advantage of this construction season than stand on stage to make an announcement with the federal government. That kind of petty politics that hurts citizens right across the country is an example of the kinds of politics that unfortunately conservative premiers are beginning to play. And if you're keeping track, there are 101 days until the federal election on October 21st. Well, Nova Scotia man spent almost 17 years behind bars for a murder he didn't commit. And now a federal report says the RCMP deleted important documents in the case. Kayla Hounsel has the details that only came to light after a CBC News reporter went to court. Glenn Assoon was already a free man, but now the full extent of his miscarriage of justice is public information. I knew someday I'd prove my innocence. I just didn't know when. Assoon was wrongfully convicted nearly 20 years ago for the murder of his former girlfriend, Brenda Way. Earlier this year, his conviction was overturned by the federal justice minister. The reasons for that decision were held in sealed documents within these boxes until CBC News, the Canadian press and the Halifax Examiner fought to have them released. The documents point to this man, serial killer Michael Wayne McGray, as another suspect. They didn't properly investigate. The people of Nova Scotia and the people of Canada deserve a justice system that they can have some faith in. The information about another possible suspect wasn't disclosed to Assoon's lawyers. An RCMP officer says he brought the information to his superiors and was told he was wasting his time. He told CBC News he was later transferred out of his unit. His digital files deleted. The hard copies have disappeared. That would be one prominent uh, feature of this case that would, that would point to shocking malfeasance. But today, the RCMP says there was no malicious intent. If anything has been done, it has not been intentional or it was a mistake. But there has been no intention for the RCMP in any way to try and do a cover-up. Lost in the discussion about justice for Assoon is the lack of justice for Brenda Way's family. I'm 30 years old now. I haven't seen my mother since I was seven. And it breaks my heart that I never got to know her. As for Assoon, he says he suffered multiple heart attacks in prison and now has mental health issues. His lawyers say he should be compensated. What price do you put on a man's life? Because, you know, in, 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 in my opinion, there, there's, there's not enough money to, to, to compensate for the injustice that I suffered. Assoon says his goal is to try to enjoy what's left of his life. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. An Ontario woman fears her brother is being detained in an internment camp in China. They are both part of the persecuted Uyghur ethnic group. As the CBC's Tamina Aziz reports, she hopes speaking out will bring answers. I don't know his life or not. There isn't a day where Bilkis Mohammed doesn't think about her brother. She used to hear from him on a weekly basis. She last heard his voice in September of 2017. She was told through a family friend that he was taken to a detention camp in China a year ago. I cry all the time. Every news I read, and I have feeling I cannot help them. I cannot help them. That's make me crazy. Very few Uyghurs are willing to speak out in fear of the safety of their relatives, but Bilkis is desperate to find answers. This woman speaking out um, and, and voicing her opposition to the Chinese government about its tactics, about its practices in Xinjiang, is very risky. According to McKnight, the Chinese government monitors all media as a means to silence family living abroad. This has really put a, uh, cast a chilling effect on how vocal Uyghurs outside of China will be of the Chinese government policies. Amnesty International estimates there are one million Uyghurs in detention camps, something the Chinese government calls re-education camps. 
Mohammed says her brother traveled to Turkey and Malaysia and believes that's the reason for his detainment. One of the many causes for being detained is having traveled to what looks like a kind of a blacklist of 26 countries. They include many of the neighboring Muslim-dominated countries. The Uyghurs in Windsor are a small but tight-knit community. They frequently meet up, but Bilkas Mohammed says there isn't a moment where they don't think about their loved ones back home. We first question ask each other, can you, did you contact your family? Did you get chance to contact your family? Mohammed says the not knowing has left her both restless and depressed. She's aware the odds are not in her favor, but she's hopeful one day she and her brother will reunite. Tamina Aziz, CBC News, Windsor. Another horse death at the Calgary Stampede. And for the first time ever, a chuck wagon driver is fined and banned. That's coming up.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Charges in the death of a cyclist who was bumped under the wheels of a dump truck in January. The driver of the parked vehicle opened his door allegedly into the bike lane and that caused a chain reaction for the biker. Now Patrick Colwell is charged under the Motor Vehicle Act. It's unfortunate because it seems hypocritical to allow international uh, wine as well as BC uh, wine, but not beer. Like what sense does that make? The Attorney General is giving a hard no to expanding the sale of alcohol, and that's not going down well with the industry, particularly local breweries. You end up getting, you know, a, a spot that should be a very, like, vibrant, important ecosystem is completely, completely wiped out because that, that's just covering the whole thing. Lost and abandoned fishing gear is destroying marine wildlife in BC, trapping fish and strangling seals. It's unknown how much ghost gear is lying beneath the surface of our coastal waters, but with an estimated 800,000 tons in the world's oceans each year, researchers are desperate to find a way to combat the problem. To Calgary now, where for the first time ever, a chuck wagon driver has been banned from future stampedes after the death of a horse at a race last night. The CBC's Dave Gilson has more, and the video you're about to see may be disturbing for some viewers. Get tight in the turn. Chad Harden held the three wide to the outside. Prior to the crash, officials say driver Chad Harden got his wagon in the way of another driver, which then caused a third wagon driven by Evan Solomon to hit the inside rail. One of Solomon's horses died and three others received minor injuries. Today, an independent Chuck Wagon Safety Commission review found the crash wasn't deliberate but says it was the result of driver error. The stampede says it has a zero tolerance policy for what it calls preventable accidents and injuries. The stampede takes us very seriously. This is about our brand. This is about our commitment to the safety of our performers, both animals and people. Harden is a veteran chuck wagon racer, a 2009 Rangeland Derby champion, and lost three of his horses when his wagon crashed at the 2012 Stampede. Back then, he called the animal's deaths devastating. He couldn't be reached for comment, but former chuck wagon driver and Harden friend Corey Glenn doesn't believe his actions were intentional. I think Chad is one of the one of the better drivers out there. Um, it's just an unfortunate accident that happened. It dang, he definitely didn't do it on purpose. You can see that in the video. I don't think it needs to be a lifetime ban. This is the third horse death at the 2019 Chuck Wagon races. As the stampede continues to face criticism from animal rights advocates, it says animal safety is of the highest priority. While we have a difference in fundamental values, we do agree on something and that we don't ever want to see an animal injured when it heads out onto our chuck wagon track. Stampede officials say according to the rules, Harden's disqualification means he won't be invited back to compete, but he can apply for reinstatement as early as September. Gabe Gilson, CBC News, Calgary. There's a live look at Metro Town at 6.37 on this Friday evening. The weekend is here and so is Brett. His forecast is next and it's looking pretty good.
Louisiana is bracing as life-threatening Tropical Storm Barry hurdles toward its coast. Tropical Storm Barry could come ashore as the first Atlantic hurricane of 2019, and it's forecast to dump as much as 64 centimeters of rain in some parts of the already waterlogged state. As the CBC's Jacqueline Hansen reports tonight, officials are urging residents to get ready. With time running out, it was all hands on deck. We're all just out there trying to do what we can. Um, local business owner, we've got local homeowners around here that are preparing for the worst. People rushed to fill sandbags, trash bags, whatever they could find, because Barry packs a punch. We are looking at uh, 10 to 20 inches of rain, uh, with some areas possibly receiving 25 inches, depending upon uh, the storm track. That's bad news for a city that's already seen flash flooding this week. The ground is saturated and there's nowhere for the water to drain. The Mississippi River is already running high, almost five meters yesterday morning. Barry will push it even higher to nearly six meters, just below the levees that protect the city. We are staying tight in communications and coordination with our local, state and federal partners. Still, Barry could be the biggest test since Katrina, a Category 5 storm that broke the levees and devastated 80% of the city. It was deemed the costliest disaster in U.S. history. Hundreds of people died. Since then, the levees have been updated and there are more flood protections in place, but the memories of 2005 weigh heavy on those who lived through it. I think after the Katrina situation, we had Gustav, and they did a much better job at getting people up and getting people out and securing the city, and I think that was a lesson learned. I'm concerned, however, that they've gotten complacent. Officials have been working all day to close the floodgates along the river. The president has already approved a state of emergency, and about 3,000 National Guard troops, along with emergency responders, are ready to move in. Now, all that's left to do is wait. That's the CBC's Jacqueline Hansen reporting tonight. And now Brett Soderholm is here mm -hmm. to talk a little bit more about that uh, hurricane. Yeah, it really is just a matter of time now. A landfall is formally expected within the next 12 hours. But I know a lot of places along the coast, they've already been seeing some high surf, some strong winds. Um, and I've already noticed a few roads have been washed out. So unfortunately, I expect those conditions to get a little bit worse. And I did want to show you what it looks like right now on our satellite imagery. Um, if you were watching yesterday, it didn't really look like much over the Gulf of Mexico. But now, Barry has really taken on a bit more of a characteristic shape. We can see this really nice spiral going on. And it is really just a couple of hours hours from making its way onto the Louisiana coastline. And uh, one fun fact, I'm not sure if you know this, when we talk about making a landfall, that really means that the center of the storm needs to intersect with a portion of the coastline. So it's expected to do so about 160 kilometers west of New Orleans, and that could be as early as tomorrow morning. Here's what Barry is doing right now. It's re presently at 100 kilometers an hour in terms of winds, which puts it at a very strong tropical storm. If it makes landfall in the next couple of hours, with potentially uh, wind speeds going up to 119 kilometers an hour, it would then be a hurricane. And this is expected throughout the next 12 hours or so. Beyond that, it's going to be tracking directly up the Mississippi River. And that is really concerning because, as we heard, the Mississippi River itself is already quite high. And all of that rain is going to need to be draining back down into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, at this point in time, I did manage to fix our legend here so that we actually can show you how much rain is expected. Big swath of anywhere between 150 to 250. 50 millimeters, and as we did here, could be 60 four centimeters worth of rain. Now closer to home, we have nowhere close to that amount of rain. And in fact, we don't really have any real significant rain on the forecast. Saturday morning, I would watch out if you are into the Fraser Valley. There is the chance for a slight shower there, but it is just going to be a mixture of sun and clouds as we go through on Saturday. By Sunday morning, I did want to mention if you are in downtown Vancouver, we could get a little bit of a shower there as well, but this is not going to be something that's going to be lingering around for very long. By contrast, our temperatures are actually going to be feeling quite nice and mild. Province-wide, we're looking at some very normal temperatures both for Saturday and for Sunday. Not a lot going on there and for us it is going to be very comfortable across the lower mainland and specifically in terms of Vancouver temperatures right around the seasonal mark 22 23 degrees. Lots of sunshine in the forecast and I did just put that little note there again for Sunday morning there's the risk of a slight shower but uh, really the next major risk for rain that we're going to be dealing with is into next week and that's going to be more so Wednesday and into Thursday. That's a pretty good stretch. Not too bad. I think it'll be nice. <laughs> very good. All right, Brett, thanks very much.
Well, our latest CBC short film in our Creator Network series introduces us to teacher Mike DiPietro, not to be confused with the Canucks goalie of the same name. DiPietro is perhaps better known as the photographer behind the website Seasons of East Van. Mind if I take a quick photo of you? Is that cool? I'll just get you standing right in the sun there. When he's not teaching chemistry, Di Pietro is capturing the changing landscape of culture of East Vancouver. He only started his photography project last year, but has since collected over 2,000 photos. I'm just trying to like capture a moment in time in terms of hopefully in 20 years, someone can look back and be like, oh yeah, that's kind of like what the late 2000 teens looked like and that's what people were doing and that's what the buildings look like and that's what the cars look like and because who knows what's going to look like in 20 years, especially in this neighborhood. It's always growing and developing and changing. Di Pietro's website is seasonsofeastvan.com and you can watch the full CBC short film on our CBC Vancouver YouTube channel. Another cabinet member gone from the Trump administration. We'll tell you who and why after the break. Another cabinet member lost for the Trump administration today. Labor Secretary Alex Acosta has resigned amid controversy over his role in the case of convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. The CBC's Artie Pohl has more from Washington. On the lawn outside the White House, surrounded by reporters, the U.S. president announced his Labor Secretary Alex Acosta submitted his resignation this morning. He has been a fantastic Secretary of Labor. The departure comes just two days after Acosta fielded questions from reporters in a news conference regarding his role in the investigation of convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, who was arrested last weekend on new sex trafficking charges. In that news conference, Acosta defended his actions in 2008. Then, Acosta was the U.S. attorney in Miami when he oversaw a non-prosecution agreement with Epstein. It resulted in the multimillionaire avoiding federal charges and serving 13 months in jail after years of abusing young women and girls. Acosta oversaw that 2008 decision. 
the secret deal, which was not shared with victims, as a judge ruled it should have been. The outgoing Labour Secretary says his role in that case has become a distraction. It would be selfish for me to stay in this position and continue talking about a case that's 12 years old rather than about the amazing economy we have right now. And so I submitted my resignation to the president effective seven days from today. Trump says this was entirely Acosta's decision. There hasn't been an ounce of controversy at the Department of Labor until this came up. And he's doing this not for himself, he's doing this for the administration. More than 50 members of Trump's administration have either been fired or quit so far during the president's first term. Deputy Labor Secretary Pat Pizzella will temporarily take over Acosta's role. As for Jeffrey Epstein, he is due back in court on Monday. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Washington. And more political drama in Washington, D.C. today. Robert Mueller has agreed to testify before the House Judiciary and Intelligence Committee on July 24th. It's expected to be a lengthy hearing, according to a committee statement. An increasing concern tonight about the safety of international oil shipments. It comes after Britain today deployed a second warship to the Gulf following this week's confrontation with Iran. CBC's Chris O'Neill Yates has more tonight from London. One fifth of the oil used around the world comes from the Persian Gulf through here, the Strait of Hormuz. 19 million barrels a day have to pass through the channel, a narrow choke point as it leaves the Persian Gulf on its way to market. Iran's recent provocations are costing the shipping industry. You're now entering an area which you need to uh, inform your insurers that you're entering, and that will result in uh, quite significant additional premiums. Again this week, another incident involving Iran, with London accusing the country of trying to seize a British tanker before being driven off by the British Navy. The U.S. wants to boost its military presence in the Gulf, and it's asking its allies for help. I think that what we're trying to do with the coalition to put that together in terms of providing military escort, naval escort, yeah. the commercial shipping may be, may be an important factor. Canada currently has no military presence in the area. The foreign affairs minister was non-committal. We talked about ways that our countries can work together both to seek to de-escalate tensions with Iran which is important to Canada and Canadians, I think important to the whole world, and also to ensure safe navigation. A new coalition could hem in Iran or cause more retaliation. Ultimately, with uh, the right strategic thinking, a level of coalition might build up to contain Iran, but we really have to wait and see what the Iranian response to it will be. Today, an Iranian official warned the UK not to get involved in this dangerous game. Red-hot rhetoric, while the last thing anyone wants is more volatility in the Persian Gulf. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, London. After the break, the power of poop to treat disease, how the bacteria in our bodies affects our health.
ABC Musical Nooners are back and better than ever, celebrating a special 10-year anniversary of free live outdoor concerts every weekday at noon on the CBC Vancouver Outdoor Stage at 700 Hamilton Street. There is something for everyone, so for details and the full schedule, check out cbc.ca slash musical nooners. Summertime in Vancouver is hard to beat, and like these shows, will be over before you know it. Don't miss out. Okay, scientists are looking for new ways to flush out harmful gut bacteria, and they believe our fecal matter matters. As Christine Birak reports, more evidence is needed to support the use of fecal transplants for a wide range of ailments. We know transplanting fecal matter from a healthy person can save the life of a patient suffering from a C. difficile bacterial infection by offering them good gut bacteria. Scientists are now trying to figure out if it can treat hundreds of other conditions, mental and physical. When I get the uh, stool specimen... And this Brace yourself. It gets into patients via pills, an enema, or in this case, a colonoscopy. And this is the colonoscope. A trial here at Toronto General is transplanting fecal matter from healthy, lean donors into obese recipients to see if it improves their weight and metabolism. When we look at the effect on insulin, blood sugar, as well as the changes in the intestinal microbiome. The microbiome is a colony of creatures living on or inside your body. Skin, gut, mouth, each area is teeming with trillions of bacteria, viruses and other microorganisms. So we either have a healthy microbiome or we don't have a healthy microbiome and that really relates to these organisms um, and how they interact with each other, the byproducts of what they release. Studies are revealing there are differences between the gut bacteria of healthy people and those with Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, autism, depression and a variety of intestinal disorders. But the question is, did the gut bacteria cause the disease or did the disease trigger changes in the gut microbiome? At this point, researchers aren't even sure what exactly is benefiting patients with C. difficile. What is actually most important? Is it actually the bacteria or is it the byproducts of the bacteria? What's actually helping the patient? We don't really know. Sort of slide it in. And yet, people are trying to capitalize on fecal transplants. My interpretation of this sort of uh, hype to data ratio right now is that we're somewhere near peak hype. Experts warn while fecal transfers may sound natural and safe, they're not. In the U.S., a study participant recently died, prompting the Food and Drug Administration to issue a warning and halt some clinical trials after donor stool wasn't properly screened for disease. Fecal transplant, you know, at, if it does nothing, if it has no positive benefits on health, it's still unpleasant and inconvenient, but it can be harmful and even deadly, and I think that that's something that everybody needs to know. Everyone agrees, understanding the microbiome holds great promise for new treatments. But there's still a lot that needs to be flushed out. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Not sure I have much to say about that. No, but it is interesting it, research and it, it can be applicable in, in so many uh, different areas. That's why they're continuing on with it. We'll leave it there. Getting to the bottom of the stuff, as, as you say. <laughs> All right, so well, speak. that is it for our program tonight. <laughs> it is the weekend. Yes, it is. Uh, but we do want to leave you with a shot of, well, these dancers on the Kiwi Plaza. Producer Matthew says they are doing the hustle. What's the hustle? Uh, do you have some info on yeah, the hustle? On, oh. well, no, I don't have any info on the hustle, but if we're wrong, oh. you can blame Producer Matthew. <laughs> this is happening uh, apparently six to eight every Friday in oh, July. Yeah, yeah we've Kiwi seen Plaza. them out there before. Yeah. And they had some uh, pretty good moves going on. We're going to move on out of here. Tina Lovegreen's here at 11 o'clock right after the National. Have a great weekend.